Hello and uh, welcome to today's webinar, An Accessible Approach to Shared Streets with Dan Goodman, Janet Barlow, and Jim Elliott. Uh, today's webinar is co-hosted by TREC in partnership with the Federal Highway Administration. My name is Hal Hagedorn and I will be your moderator for today. I'm currently the Interim Director for TREC, which is the Transportation Research and Education Center here at Portland State University. Um, a little bit about TREC, we house the National Institute for Transportation and Communities and also uh, administer the Initiative for Bicycle and Pedestrian Innovation, as well as other grants and programs. Um, our main mission is to produce timely, practical research useful to transportation decision makers, as well as supporting the education of future transportation professionals through curriculum development and student participation in research. So our speakers today are Dan Goodman, Janet Barlow uh, with the Accessible Design for the Blind. Dan Goodman is, the, is with the Federal Highway Administration and Jim Elliott, who is with Tool Design Group. So a little bit about Dan um, before we begin. Uh, Dan Goodman is a transportation specialist in the Office of Human Environment at uh, FHWA. He leads FHWA's Pedestrian and Bicycle Program and its Pedestrian and Bicycle Work Group, which oversees the work of the Pedestrian and Bicycle Information Center. He serves as one of FHWA's representatives on the US DOT Pedestrian and Bicycle Coordinating Committee and is uh, the representative to AASHTO Joint Technical Committee on Non-Motorized Transportation. In 2016, he received the Professional of the Year, uh, the Public Sector Award from the Association of Pedestrian and Bicycle Professionals. We also have Janet Barlow, who is a certified orientation and mobility specialist with over 30 years of experience teaching independent travel skills to individuals who are blind or who have low vision. In addition, she has been involved in numerous research projects evaluating the ability of individuals who are blind to use navigational aids, signals, and equipment effectively and safely in accessibility research and intersection design. Her research has also included the use of accessible pedestrian signals, crossing treatments at roundabouts, including uh, rapid uh, rectangular flashing beacons, um, PHBs, and raised crosswalks, detecting streets at curb ramps, alignment cues and strategies, um, and developing and testing of an intersection characteristics database for pedestrians with law, uh, vision loss. She chairs the Environmental Access uh, Committee of the Association for Education and Rehabilitation of the Blind and Visually Impaired um, and is uh, in contact with orientation and mobility specialists and in individuals who are blind or visually impaired throughout the US. Third, we have Jim Elliott, who is a senior planner with over eight years of experience working to promote and support active transportation for people of all ages and abilities. As a person with a visual impairment that prevents him from driving, Jim is acutely aware of the challenges people with visual impairments face in the built environment. So before I hand it over to Dan, I'd like to give you a brief overview of the structure of the webinar. Uh, Dan, Janet, and Jim will present for about 50, 40 minutes. During this time, you can submit questions which will be answered at the end of the webinar. Um, if we do receive some questions, clarifying questions that make sense to interrupt the panelists, um, I will do that. We are recording uh, today's webinar and we'll be making it available on our website. You will, all, you will also receive the video recording and presentation slides um, in an email following the webinar in the next day or two. So we do want to acknowledge that some of you may have vision issues, so we will try to accommodate that um, within the, the presentation with image tags and uh, include notes. For those that are tracking professional development hours, this webinar is eligible for one hour of continuing education credit. And so those instructions on how to redeem the credit will be uh, posted in that, that, that email that we will send out to you. 
Uh, just for your information, we have uh, two upcoming webinars on February 7th. Uh, there's a webinar on rethinking ecological momentary assessment data collection strategies for transportation research. And on March 7th, I will be presenting on the Bike Ped Portal, which is a national bicycle and pedestrian count archive. Um, and then thirdly, uh, we wanted to share with you that um, if you're interested in learning more about the topic we're discussing today, we are co-hosting a one-day summit, Mo Mobility Matters, here in Portland, um, Oregon, at Portland State University on Friday, March 9th. Um, early bird pricing ends next week on February 1st, um, and there is discounted pricing for students. So with that, I hand it over to Dan, Janet, and Jim to talk about their work. Great. Thank you so much, Hal. Um, this is Dan Goodman. Um, I work in the Office of Human Environment at the Federal Highway Administration. Um, what I'm going to do is, is kick things off, and, and my goal is to briefly provide an overview um, of this project, um, but but pretty quickly pass to, to my colleagues Jim Elliott um, and Janet Barlow to go into the details. Um, we're going to be talking about FHWA's new resource. Um, we published it in the fall. Um, it's called Accessible Shared Streets, Notable Practices and Considerations for Accommodating Pedestrians with this Vision Disabilities. Um, so, so the topic of the webinar is shared streets, and just to, to, to start off, I'll say that a shared street is a low-speed, low-volume public road um, where pedestrians, bicyclists, and motor vehicles are sharing the same space, um, and Jim will, will talk um, in more detail about that. Um, the Office of Human Environment at Federal Highway Administration sponsored and led this project, um, but I want to emphasize that we worked really closely with our Office of Infrastructure, Safety, Operations, um, Civil Rights, and we also engaged with the FHWA division offices, um, especially um, in the four communities where we held workshops as part of the project. Um, we held workshops in Silver Spring, Minneapolis, um, Seattle, and Pittsburgh. Um, we also coordinated really closely with our national uh, partners and stakeholders. So. Um, just as a few examples, we worked closely with the U.S. Access Board, the National Association of City Transportation Officials, um, and, and advocates um, for people with, with disabilities at the local um, and state level um, across the country. So the purpose of this, of this resource is really to capture the national state of practice, um, but I want to offer a few caveats that um, we're attempting to capture the national state of practice at a time of rapid innovation. Um, we recognize that there's an ongoing dialogue around these areas, um, that more research is needed on a lot of the topics, um, and that certainly this resource is not the final word. Um, I also want to acknowledge that, that the resource is not intended to be um, a comprehensive design guide about everything you need to know about shared streets. Rather, it's trying to focus in on the question of um, if you are going to implement a shared street, how do you make sure that it's still an accessible place, specifically for people with um, visual disabilities? We, we recognize throughout the document that this is a context-sensitive decision um, that requires engineering judgment um, and that, that not all locations are appropriate for, for this particular um, treatment. I also want to emphasize that there's no new regulations associated with, with this document. It's clearly just a resource to inform the planning and design process. The project was also part of a bigger picture conversation. Um, so, so accessible shared streets was one component of the project, but we also took a pretty comprehensive look at things like separated bike lanes, transit stops and platforms, complex intersections and roundabouts. Um, and we did a pretty detailed scan of existing guidance issues, potential opportunities, um, design considerations, and navigational challenges. Um, and the broader, kind of bigger picture context that we did this project um, 
a few things I want to note is that FHWA is supporting and encouraging design flexibility, um, that we're encouraging our partners and stakeholders to think about um, connected multimodal networks and that shared streets are potentially one element of a connected pedestrian and bicycle network. Um, FHWA is very focused on the transportation planning process and public involvement is a key element of that planning process and so this project um, details that. Um, it's also one of a, a larger suite of resources that FHWA has created um, and it's, it's really a, a surge of activity intended to give our state and local partners resources to help them deliver high quality projects efficiently and effectively um, and to address um, the needs of people with disabilities. Um, USDOT has a draft strategic plan out and I would encourage everybody to take a look at that. Um, four goals in, in the draft strategic plan are safety, infrastructure, innovation, and accountability. And I would encourage you to think about those four goals as, as, you, as you hear the information on this webinar. Um, and, and I would argue that this resource responds to all four of those goals um, in a certain way. Um, okay, so to, to wrap things up, I'll just mention a few other um, context, context notes before I pass to, uh, to Jim and, and Janet. Um, I want to mention that this resource is really intended to improve the planning and design process. Um, it's a model. The study process that we undertook um, to create this document, I think, is a model for engaging people with disabilities in the planning process. Um, and you'll hear more about the four workshops that we did um, and also peer exchanges. Um, it's really a response to state and local demand. One of the reasons that we um, undertook this project was because people were asking um, for technical assistance around these areas and so um, in a sense it was due diligence to help us respond to that to that demand that we were hearing. Um, it's also a way to to provide a resource that's really critical to our state DOT uh, partners and stakeholders and so um, you may have a shared street on a state DOT or you may have a shared street crossing a state road You've got state DOTs getting requests for project reviews. You have state DOTs that are updating their state um, design manuals. And you've, you've got agencies at the local, regional, and state level thinking about their ADA um, responsibilities. And so we hope that this is a helpful resource um, to inform that um, conversation. The last thing I'll say um, is that we also see shared streets as part of um, you know, a broader economic development and economic revitalization conversation that's happening. Specifically, how do transportation investments encourage and promote economic development and revitalization? Um, and so, you know, part of the purpose of this document and, and the webinar is, is to encourage people to think about how we realize that economic development potential um, in a way that still meets the needs of people with, with visual disabilities. Um, so that's the, the general overview and context that I wanted to provide. Um, and now I'm going to pass it to, to Jim and Janet to um, talk about the details of the project and the study process. Okay, thanks, Dan. And this is Jim. I'd like to start by giving a little background on Shared Streets to put uh, the Shared Streets Guide into context. And uh, Dan, you stole my thunder a little bit uh, because this starts out with what is a shared street? To, reiter to reiterate what Dan said, um, the Accessible Shared Streets uh, resource defines a shared street as a street that includes a shared zone where pedestrians, bicyclists, and motor vehicles mix in the same space. The photo at the right shows an example of what I'm talking about. It shows a shared street in an urban environment. There are no curbs or pavement markings. People are walking and standing in the middle, and a car is passing through. We adopted this definition to distinguish streets that are truly shared from streets that look similar because they lack curves, curbs, but aren't meant to be shared. Such streets are called curbless streets in the guide. Since you're typically dealing with higher speeds and volumes on a curbless street, you need to think much more carefully about how to prevent pedestrians with vision disabilities from inadvertently crossing into vehicular lanes at locations that are not designated crossings. Now I'm going to give a very short history 
of shared streets so you understand where we've come from and where we are today. This slide shows a photo of Herald Square in New York City in 1908. There are pedestrians, streetcars, and horse-drawn carriages all sharing the same space. People are stopping and socializing. The street is a place in its own right. It's a shared street. This slide shows a photograph from New York City in the 1930s. The scene is transformed. Pedestrians crowd the sidewalk and a bumper to bumper stream of cars dominates the center. Nobody's going to hang out socializing here. The street is less of a place and more of a means for getting from point A to B. This is where we left things for much of the 20th century. Until now. Fast forward to the 21st century and we see a resurgence of interest in shared streets. Here's a news clip from DC where I live. The headline says, DC will get nine blocks of shared streets this fall. Here's a clip from Streets Blog in New York City. The headline says, DOT's new flat iron shared space, a rarity or the first of many? Here's another from Chicago. Work begins on Chicago's first shared street. And there are a number of other examples that I could have put up. So what accounts for the resurgence of shared streets? It has largely to do with the per their perceived benefits. I'm going to mention a few of those next. For one, shared streets provide additional space for pedestrians. This photo shows Exhibition Road in London, and you can see that there's a lot of room for pedestrians to spread out. Shared streets can provide an expanded accessible walking area as well. This slide includes two photos. There's an inset photo that shows the street before it was reconstructed as a shared street. It has very narrow sidewalks with pinch points at trees and signs and extreme cross slopes at driveways. The main photo shows what the street looks like now. The sidewalks have been eliminated and there is a woman with a baby carriage walking up the center of the street, which is now shared and accessible. Shared streets can also provide space for amenities and events. This is a photo of Bell Street Park in Seattle. As the name suggests, this shared space is intended to serve as a park. The photo shows a table and chairs and lots of trees and planters. This space could easily be used for a farmer's market or other event. Shared streets also provide improved access to destinations along the street. This photo shows a shared street in Boston with shops on either side. Imagine you're shopping along the street. You go to Jewelry Plus, perhaps, um, buy, buy your husband a gold chain and then across the radio shack for a flat screen. It's almost effortless and you could do it easily in a wheelchair, which is why shared streets can also be good for economic development. Finally, shared streets can improve safety if they, if they succeed in reducing motor vehicle speeds and volumes. This slide includes an image from the Denver Vision Zero plan showing the likelihood of a pedestrian fatality when motor vehicles are going various speeds. It goes from 13% at 20 miles per hour to 73% at 40 miles per hour. Clearly, the lower the speed, the better, and shared streets need to have speeds much lower than 20 miles per hour to function as intended. There is also an argument that by eliminating conventional roadway features like curbs and pavement markings, shared streets create a sense of uncertainty that results in everyone proceeding more cautiously. Despite these benefits, there are real concerns about how shared streets work for people with vision disabilities. In the UK, where numerous shared streets have been constructed in recent years, these concerns have made headlines. For example, here's a headline from the BBC. It says, Halt City Shared Spaces, says a report by Lord Holmes. Shared space is a term used in the UK for shared street. Here's another one. It says, new chief executive of Norfolk and Norwich Association for the Blind throws down gauntlet for Norwich planners. In this article, the new chief expresses frustration that the association's feedback on shared space design hasn't been incorporated. And here's yet another one. It says, blind man's shared space roads warning as blind numbers in Swinton, Swindon jump by 30%. The warning is that shared street schemes are particularly problematic for people with vision disabilities and many simply avoid them. I mentioned the Lord Holmes report. Well, that was based on an unscientific survey of 852 respondents, approximately 10% of which had a vision disability. Here are some quotes from the survey about crossing shared streets. As I have a guide dog, he finds it impossible to find the correct crossing point. 
frightening, walking into a stream of moving traffic, which I can't see. And here are some comments about how the lack of curbs can impact navigation. Difficulty in navigating due to absence of any clear indicator, such as a curb, feeling of insecurity, wish that I wasn't there. I could not use the shared space safely as there was no definition of a curb to tell me where the pavement started or ended. I would not be able to use them on my own. Pavement is the UK term for sidewalk. Finally, here are some quotes about the difficulty of identifying the safest place to walk. It, it was horrific as I couldn't work out where the safest place for me to walk was. I'm blind. Not knowing the difference between the place where I'm safe and the bit where I can, get, can be killed is scary. The point is not to discourage development of shared streets in the United States, but rather to emphasize that there are some very real concerns related to how well they accommodate people with vision disabilities. This seems like a good time to mention accessibility requirements here in the US. This slide shows an image from Easter Seals celebrating the 26th anniversary of ADA. It says, disability rights are civil rights. Title II of the Americans with Disabilities Act provides that no person with a disability shall, because of, pub because of a public entities, because of public entities facilities are inaccessible or unusable, be excluded from the participation in or deny the benefits of a public entity's programs, services, or activities. And that includes shared streets. And now I'm going to turn it over to Janet Barlow to provide an overview of the stakeholder engagement process that we went through to, de to develop the guide and some of the key takeaways from that process. Thanks, Jim. Um, as Dan mentioned, this project involved lots of input from various stakeholders through interviews, workshops, and focus groups. Um, I'll first talk about the process, then a quick overview of some of the lessons learned. I urge you to read the Shared Streets Guide and use this as a resource for more information and details because we're not going to cover everything today. Um, the stakeholder engagement process, we conducted interviews with uh, some selected individuals from the U.S. Access Board staff, Federal Highway Administration, FHWA, a National Association of City Transportation Officials, and a conference call webinar um, with representatives of cities of shared streets, basically a peer exchange activity. The more extensive part of the project involved the full day workshops and focus groups. I'll tell you more about who attended, what we did, and where they were held as we go through the next few slides. Um, first, people who were invited to the workshops and focus groups included individuals with vision disabilities, including people who were both deaf and blind. Uh, also included people with low vision, uh, individuals with mobility disabilities, orientation and mobility specialists, shared street designers, and federal, state, and local government officials. Um, at each work workshop, we started out with an overview of shared streets, an ex explanation of the typical elements of shared split streets. Some of the individuals attending had not um, heard of or experienced shared streets. We use tactile graphics to convey some of the design elements um, for individuals who are blind. The photo near the top of the screen shows approximately 25 people around a table, some with dog guides at their feet, and a presentation on the screen at the front of the room. This is from one of the workshops. And the photo on bottom left of the screen shows a raised line graphic of a shared street with an individual's fingers near the bottom of the graphic. These are graphics we used in the uh, uh, workshops. After the overview presentation and discussion, we went to a nearby shared street to experience it in small groups, usually about 10 people per group. And um, those groups discussed the various features as we walked through there, um, what was used. We got feedback from the users with disabilities about kind of what worked and what didn't work for them. A photo on the screen shows a group of people, some in wheelchairs, some with white canes, standing in the middle of a shared street involved in discussion. We returned to the conference room after that for both some small group and large group discussions of the features and issues at that location. Talked about some experience in other locations and just general likes and dislikes uh, of, that were experienced by the individuals. Um, pictures on the picture on the screen shows a group in the room sitting in chairs in that discussion, one of those discussions. 
As uh, Dan mentioned, we held the workshop and focus groups. Uh, we had a workshop in, in different cities. We had a workshop in Silver Spring, a workshop in um, Seattle. Um, the locations were chosen to facilitate the on the street experience. So proximity to a shared street was an important consideration. Um, there were full day workshops in Silver Spring and Seattle, half day focus group in Minneapolis that was in conjunction with the US Access Board meeting um, it also included presentations from NACTO representatives. And we had a focus group in Pittsburgh at a conference of orientation mobility specialists. So most in attendance at that one were individuals who teach travel and street crossing skills to individuals with vision disabilities. So let me talk now about what we learned, some of the key takeaways, but just a reminder, there's a lot more detail in the shared streets guide. First of all, Shared streets need to be reliably detectable by individuals with vision disabilities. Individuals need to be able to recognize a transition from the pedestrian only space or the sidewalk to a shared zone, like their entry basically into the shared space area. They also need to be able to detect the transition from the shared spaces back to the typical street, the end of that shared space area. In particular, the end of shared space must be detectable um, so pedestrians can, with vision disabilities can interpret that transition, find a designated crossing of the conventional street. If they've been walking in the middle of a shared space, they might walk right into the intersections, intersecting street during some kind of gap in traffic and not even realize it. So it's important for that to be uh, noticeable. Uh, and it's really important for everyone to recognize the change of space. Um, before I go any further, I do want to point out here, because many people don't seem to recognize and understand this, that people who are blind or who have low vision do travel to new places. They're not oriented in advance to every location where they may go. Uh, just like sighted people, they may use some type of GPS or phone program for directions or get directions from others to go to an appointment, a store, a restaurant, or other locations, places that they have not been oriented to or not been to before. So they're just uh, following directions and getting to that location. So the assumption of many people is that people who are blind are shown everywhere they're gonna go and they only go to certain places, but that is not an accurate uh, assumption. So recognize that as I'm talking more. Um, the design must distinguish the shared street from conventional streets. This can be done through some kind of gateway treatment uh, traffic calming measures, detectable changes in surface texture and color, or other design order uh, elements. But it is important to the street functioning in the shared manager manner that is intended that this be clearly indicated to all. This shared street looked and functioned like a typical vehicular street. It wasn't truly shared. One photo on the screen shows the shared street with a vehicle in the travel lane and a wheelchair user over against the edge of the landscaping. Um, second photo shows a sign that was the beginning of the three block shared street say, saying multi-use roadway with graphics of vehicles, pedestrians, and bicycles. The street is concrete. Vehicles move quickly on the street, did not seem to be aware of it as a shared street, despite the sign. It had um, the concrete rather than typical asphalt surface, but most cars were turning onto it off of a major street bridge, which was also concrete. Using a different surface um, can alert drivers and others to the shared street environment. In the photo shown here, the shared street has a dark paver surface with concrete gutter areas separating the street portion from the brick comfort zone on each side. This uh, is a photo from one of our workshops. There are people in yellow vests walking around in the street area, some using white canes. It was noted that there is a need for regular maintenance of pavers or brick to maintain accessibility for wheelchair users. Another big issue that came up in the workshops and in our experience, Adam, was that a clear path is important. If there's what's considered a comfort zone, space for pedestrians to walk on the sides of the shared street, a uh, clear path needs to be maintained. Uh, in the photo shown here, there are cafe tables with umbrellas on one side, a tree on the other side, and narrows it to less than three feet. 
at this workshop, we saw a wheelchair user attempting with great difficulty to navigate on the very rough cobblestone street surface because he couldn't pass through between the tree well and tables. Participants in the workshop actually suggested a different surface, maybe light colored concrete uh, for a, you know, five, six foot area to be kept clear to help the restaurant owners and others recognize uh, where the pedestrian path needed to be kept open to travel through there. One of the other big issues of discussion in the guide is what are called tactile walking surface indicators. This is the overall term used internationally to describe what we call detectable warning surfaces. <coughs> Excuse me or truncated domes, and also um, to cover um, various guidance surfaces or directional indicators. Detectable warning surfaces in the US are a hazard warning used at the edge of the street or a train platform. There's specifications for the dome height and spacing in the ADA standards and in proposed PROAG. Detectable warning surfaces are used in other countries as an attention field at locations um, in conjunction with the guidance surface to indicate a turn. <coughs> Excuse me. However, detectable warning surfaces are pretty tightly defined in US standards as a hazard warning. And that use um, to defining a, a term or a turn within the surface doesn't seem appropriate here. Feedback from some stakeholders also indicated they did not want to see detectable warning surfaces used along the edge of a shared street because it would give the idea that uh, you can't walk out there and so it would convey the wrong message about the street uses. <coughs> Sorry. There are no specifications in the US for what are called directional indicators in the guide. Different terms such as bar tiles or guidance surfaces are used uh, as terms used internationally. This surface is used in other countries to provide guidance along a path or to indicate the location of a crosswalk. Here's a graphic showing the two types of surfaces. Graphic on the left shows the detectable warning surface of small domes arranged in parallel rows. Under the graphic are the words warning, stop, attention, the meaning of this type of surface. The graphic on the right shows the directional indicator surface made up of parallel bars. Under this graphic are the words direction of travel, accessible pathway, landmark, destination, uh, the meanings ascribed to this type of surface. One of the main things to be aware of in looking at or using these types of surfaces is an understanding of what is detectable. There's been extensive research in the US and internationally on surface detection by individuals who have vision disabilities. The surface needs to be detected and recognized both underfoot and with a cane or with a cane. Uh, this requires it to be raised above the surrounding surface and there to be spacing between the raised surface sections in order to detect the difference. Um, there are graphics here showing the specifications for detectable warning surfaces in the ADA standards in terms of dome spacing and dome size. The graphic on left shows the dome spacing, which shows 0.65 inch minimum distance measured between the base of the domes and 1.6 inch to 2.4 inches measured between the dome top centers. The graphic on the right shows information about the dome size, its height and shape. The dome height is 0.2 inches above the um, base. The dome size is 0.9 inches to 1.4 inches base diameter with a top diameter that is 50 to 65% of the base diameter. So there are clear um, specifications for the detectable warning and its size and shape. Um, also um, specifications for the installation on detectable warning surfaces. They include that the surface is a minimum of 24 inches in the direction of pedestrian travel, is installed the full width of the flush sidewalk street interface at pedestrian street crossings or crosswalks, and the color must contrast with the adjoining surface, either light on dark or dark on light. Photo on the screen shows a detectable warning surface installed at a crosswalk. There's a person standing on one edge of the yellow detectable warning surface. It extends to a planter on the other edge of the crosswalk at the edge of the street. The tactile surfaces that are intended to provide navigational information um, have to be detectable, just like detectable warning surfaces. 
That detectability depends critically on bar spacing and bar height, as well as the width of the bar. Um, the ISO or International Standards Organization has a standard which specifies the bar spacing for different bar widths. The photo on the screen shows a yellow surface of raised bars about a foot wide. There are four bars across the width, the space between each bar that's similar to the or width of the top surface of the bar. In other words, pretty large gaps between the bars. When we were on the street, stakeholders noted that groove surfaces um, were not detectable. The groove surface shown here was called corduroy um, and had been used in two cities where we did workshops. While it looks detectable, it was not detectable by most participants, either underfoot or with a cane. Uh, the surface research years ago that was called corduroy then had much larger grooves between the raised areas. <coughs> Excuse me. Directional indicators or guidance surfaces need to have underfoot detectability, cane detectability, and not be an impediment to wheelchair users. The guide discusses involvement of people who are blind in choosing surfaces for installation and working uh, um, together cooperatively to really look at those surfaces in advance. Um, photo on a shared street with a darker surface with lines in it along the edge and a person with a white cane kneeling beside the surface. Sorry. Any tactile surface intended to provide navigational information must also be consistently applied. The same grooves to corduroy surface shown in the previous slide is installed in this photo. <coughs> I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Along the edge of the streets, there are also angled portions of the directional surface. <coughs> so if detected, what does it mean? Um, Another problematic example um, of tactile surface is intended to provide navigational information. <coughs> a photo shows a location where there is both detectable warning surface on the curb ramp. The beyond it was a directional surface along the edge of the street, the gutter. Attendees who are blind didn't detect the additional directional indicator surface after the detectable warning surface, so they weren't confused by it. But those who were low vision wondered about it. Again. What does it mean? And if it was detectable, uh, what kind of what would be somebody's response to it? What should be their response to it is part of the question. And at each workshop, the need for maintenance of landscaping features was discussed. Uh, it came up regularly among blind participants um, who had encounters with trees or bushes, such as a photo on the screen. The photo shows two men, one with a white cane in his hand and the leaves of a tree in front of his face, the other reaching his hand out toward him. And another key message um, was that you need to consider and engage people with a range of vision disabilities. Jim will talk more about it uh, and engaging people in workshops and public meetings. People who attended talked about previous problems with involvement in meetings, which included lack of accessible notice, inaccessible information at the meetings, and things being done for them without their input. Um, again, I urge you to look at the um, full guide for more detail than I could possibly cover here, and I'll turn it over to Jim to tell you more about the guide. Okay, thank you, Janet. I'm going to provide an overview of some additional takeaways from Accessible Shared Streets, focusing on Shared Streets planning and the design toolbox. Um, what do you need to know about planning accessible streets? Uh, first, who to involve. On this, something we heard over and over again is that you can't just involve the one blind person you know. If you involve just that one person, you may be missing a lot. It's much better to involve a range of people with vision disabilities. Groups that represent people with vision disabilities are also good to involve. Examples include local chapters of the National Federation for the Blind, American Council for the Blind, and guide dog user groups. Who else is worth involving? How about orientation and mobility specialists like Janet? Orientation and mobility specialists help people with vision disabilities to travel safely, confidently, and independently. Because they work so closely with people who have vision disabilities, they often have very good insights. Finally, senior groups. A much higher percentage of seniors have vision disabilities than members of other age groups, 
and groups that advocate for seniors are often very familiar with the challenges. How do you reach out to people with vision disabilities and how do you ensure that they can fully participate? In terms of outreach, one thing you can do is reach out to agencies and organizations that serve people with vision disabilities. I've mentioned some of these already. There are also local radio reading services that you can advertise on. In terms of ensure, ensuring that people with vision disabilities are able to fully participate, it is really important to ask people up front if they need special accommodations. We asked this question on the registration form for each of our workshops. Another thing we did was provide meeting presentations in advance. We didn't just provide the slides, we also provided detailed notes, in some cases a full script. We also included descriptions of images and graphics. This enabled people with vision disabilities to preview the presentations. We also hired interpreters for our deaf-blind participants. We typically need two, to hire two deaf-blind interpreters per deaf-blind person, so this will require some funding. This slide shows some things you can do to enable people with vision disabilities to participate fully in your meetings. One thing is to print copies of presentations and other meeting materials within large text. A few of the participants in our stakeholders uh, uh, participate in our stakeholder workshops specifically requested this. It's also important when you are presenting images and graphics to describe them in detail. To do this, you need to build a little more time into your presentation and avoid saying things like, as you can see here, since of course, not everyone can see. In the course of the meeting, it's also important to actively engage people with vision disability. Remember that these people may have valuable insights that can improve your street design, and they may be more reluctant to speak than others. Finally, think about ways to convey street designs in a tactile fashion. We developed a booklet of tactile graphics covering some of the key design concepts we wanted to talk about. A photo of this is shown here. What do you need to know about designing shared streets? Uh, the answer is that there's a lot, there's a lot to know, uh, but I'm gonna to try to hit a few of the high points before we run out of time here. The toolbox opens with a set of design principles for shared streets. I'm gonna to touch on four of them. First, context of sensitivity. This is the idea that there is no single right way to design a shared street. Rather, shared street designs must respond to the unique context in which they are situated, including adjacent land uses, available right-of-way, pedestrian, bicycle, and motor vehicle circulation patterns, and other unique attributes of the site. Second, layers of information. This is the idea that you need to communicate navigational information to pedestrians with vision disabilities in multiple ways. A list of potential navigation clues is provided at the right, including the alignment of, of the pedestrian access routes and other streetscape features, tactile walking surface indicators, detectable edges and changes in surface texture, contrasting colors, signs and markings, and audible information. The reason for incorporating multiple cues has to do with the range of vision disabilities and navigation strategies. It also has to do with changes in the weather and fluctuations in local conditions that may affect the usefulness of, of a particular cue. For example, people who are blind often use sounds to navigate. However, sound may not be as useful on a shared street if traffic is extremely limited, there are other interfering sounds, or sounds are muffled due to snow. Third, consistency and predictability. Imagine you are blind and have never navigated a shared street before. How do you know where the crossings are? How do you know where, where to expect vehicles? Shared street designers need to think about how people with vision disabilities might interpret different treatments. For example, the same tactile surface might be used for both a decorative purpose and to provide cues to people with vision disabilities. But what happens, but what happens if this surface is used in a purely decorative fashion in one place and for navigation in another? It creates the, the potential for some real confusion. The fourth is universal design for all. This is the idea that even if you think about the needs of people with vision dis disabilities, you also need to keep in mind how your decisions may impact people with physical disabilities. If you add some kind of tactile surfacing or curb to the design, how does that impact people in wheelchairs? Remember, ADA requirements apply to people with all types of disabilities. After laying out general design principles, the toolbox dives into how, design, how to design specific components of a shared street. I'm going to go through a few of these to give you the flavor. 
This slide highlights the shared zone, which is the zone where pedestrians, bicyclists, and motor vehicle drivers mix. Key points include that the design of the shared zone should be visually distinct from conventional streets, be detectable by people with vision disabilities, and incorporate traffic calming elements. On this last point, I want to emphasize that shared streets must have relatively low motor vehicle speeds and volumes in order for pedestrians to feel comfortable on them. For speeds, the guide recommends 15 miles per hour or less. This slide highlights the comfort zone, which is a pedestrian exclusive zone that runs parallel to the shared zone and includes the pedestrian access route. There's not always sufficient right of way to incorporate a comfort zone, but where space is available, comfort zones can be particularly beneficial for people with vision disabilities who may feel less comfortable mixing with motor vehicle traffic. This slide highlights the shared street gateway. The purpose of the gateway is to convey to all roadway users that they are entering a different kind of space and to motor vehicle drivers to slow down and look out for pedestrians and bicyclists. Key features include signage indicating a shared street, changes in roadway surface and texture, treatments that physically or visually narrow the street, such as curb extensions and street trees, vertical traffic calming measures, such as the driveway ramp shown in the image, and movable elements, uh, such as planners or removable, removable bollards that can be used to temporarily block the street. Finally, a quick conclusion to recap some key points. Interest in shared streets is on the rise in the United States due to recognition of their many potential benefits. In fact, new shared streets are being planned, designed, and constructed as we speak. We need to make sure shared street designs are accessible to people with disabilities as required by ADA. Involving pedestrians with a range of vision disabilities in shared street planning and design is critical for fulfilling that requirement. Detectable surfaces, surfaces like directional indicators can help with navigation, but they must be consistently applied. And finally, accessible shared streets is a groundbreaking resource, but there are still a lot of questions related to the design of shared streets and accessible shared streets that need to be worked out, and more research is on the way. Great. Thank you, Dan, Jana, and Jim. Um, that was a really great and important uh, presentation uh, regarding accessibility and shared streets. So we do have a number of questions from our panel, uh, from our audience, and so I'm just going to ask those questions in the order they came in. The first one um, uh, is, are there any best practices to deal with bike ped conflicts in shared streets where there is no separation between the two modes? Uh, are there any traffic calming measures you'd recommend to slow bicycles down to walking speeds? Um, I can answer that. I, okay. I mean, I think, I think one of the key ones might be a change in surface texture for the street. I mean, that's also something that will slow motor vehicles down and, and works for, for bicyclists as well. Um, of course, you want to think about um, how bicyclists experience that. You know, you can't um, make it too rough or it might, might uh, be difficult for bicyclists to navigate. Great. Uh, so the next one, I think Dan can answer this, but feel free to weigh in, um, uh, Janet and Jim. Are there any special approvals necessary to use directional indicators on a federally funded project? Uh, and the example was FHWA. And then are there any concerns about liability issues when directional indi indicators, because there is no U.S. standard, would the ISO standard be considered a standard? Yeah, I'd be happy to answer that, um, and, and I guess I'll, I'll need to answer it in a way that I, I I can't offer any kind of official national answer to that. If you have a specific question um, about the approval for the use of the directional indicator, um, I would encourage you to reach out to your FHWA division office, um, and I think that needs to be a conversation between the FHWA division office, the state DOT, um, and and the um, staff at headquarters at Federal Highway, um, and it would likely include folks from our Office of Civil Rights and our Office of Infrastructure as well. Um, so I don't feel comfortable offering kind of a, a, a nationwide answer to that question, if that's okay. Um, 
but we would I definitely would encourage you to reach out um, and you're welcome to reach out to me directly um, or as I said the FHWA division office in your state um, did I miss was there a second part of the question it uh, the, the other question was if there is no standard would ISO standard be considered a standard the ISO standard the ISO standard is is the best that we could find and so we asked um, for ISO's permission to put it in our document and we did that um, and and they provided that that permission to us um, or the organization that's responsible for that permission provided us um, with that ability to put it in our document but I think it's definitely falls within that realm of things that we recognize need more research um, we put it in our document because we think it has a lot of potential um, but we also um, think that more research is needed on the application of that um, that that treatment in the US context as, as Jim and Janet mentioned you know detectable um, directional indicators are in use in a lot of other countries and they're they're in use in the US um, but I think a lot of the the research needs to focus on um, that question of um, reliable detection and consistently applied I think those are four really important take-homes from the webinar is 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 those two concepts reliably detected detectable and consistently applied and I think that's um, where we need to go with the research in the US context great thank you for that uh, in your research did you find any model shared streets that we can put forth as successful examples and feel free any of the panelist members can jump in yeah, I think I think there's some good examples in the United States. I think you know, um, you know, I think the ones that we visited, we you know, we were sort of focused on um, identifying areas that could be improved. Um, you know, but I think there there are some some very good examples. Um, you know, the the examples in in Boston and Cambridge um, that I showed in the slides. Um, I think are pretty good examples of shared street design in the United States. Internationally, um, there are a number of good, of good examples. I, I'm not super familiar with them. Um, one, you know, that comes up a lot is Exhibition Road in, in London. There was a photograph of that earlier on as an example of a shared street. But Great. I think, you know, that, that being yeah, said, I think there's I, a I, lot of concern about about Exhibition Road from blind participants. So I wouldn't suggest that really as the best idea um, from what I've heard internationally. So I think there there's a lot of uh, pluses at many of the shared streets we visited. And um, most of the ones I've seen in the U.S. have some issues that make them less usable for people who are blind or who have low vision than I'd like to see. Consistency is the main thing we really need to look for. One of the um, attendees said that there are some great examples in New Zealand, so perhaps uh, we can look towards New Zealand for some examples. Um, so with that, are there any, uh, are there a set of best practices for the accessibility and safety for people with disabilities and seniors with sidewalk level bike lanes and high use corridors? And the example from the attendee who's asking this question is, here in San Francisco, they are seeing sidewalk level bike lanes being proposed for some of their most bustling streets. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that was one of the issues that we tackled in the project, um, looking at, at uh, separated bike lanes and the challenges that they pose for pedestrians with vision disabilities. Uh, and there's, there's a particular challenge with sidewalk level separated bike lanes because there's no curb there. and you know, one of the things I, I mentioned earlier, sort of um, through the Lord Holmes report, is is sort of the, the importance of curbs to pedestrians with vision disabilities for navigation. Um, on the other hand, sidewalk level um, separated bike lanes have some benefits. One is that they're a lot more accessible for 
for people with um, mobility disabilities. Um, so, you know, I, I think um, directional indicators could be really helpful on a sidewalk level separated bike lane to help people with vision disabilities stay within the pedestrian part of the, the shared facility um, and, and locate uh, crossings. So that's, that's one potential best practice. And you see that in, in places like the Netherlands. Um, you know, so I guess what I wanna say is that there's some pluses and minuses, but I think there are some, some design treatments that can help. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and Jim, I would just add to that, um, that the sort of the, the tools to, to have that conversation um, exist to some extent in, in the FHWA separated bike lane planning design guide, the Massachusetts DOT separated uh, bike uh, planning and design guide. Um, there's a lot of conversations happening around the, the update to the AASHTO uh, bike guide and obviously there's a lot of great NACTO resources that FHWA has supported the use of. Um, so I think I think some of the initial tools are there to start that conversation, um, but I think there's certainly a need um, for more uh, planning and design resources in this this regard in the U.S. Okay. So uh, the next question is: Great to hear that disability groups were involved and various different user experiences sought and factored in. My concern is that we cannot force a shared street to happen. Design elements may have to include reducing motor traffic, a highly political act. How can we ensure that the shared street ethos is not politically misused? And what can we do to avoid lazy, half-hearted design options that would discredit any inclusive shared streets? And then um, in, in parentheses, it's maybe my question is about policy implementation. How can we ensure a good design guide is implemented fully. I guess my, my response to that is that um, that we accomplish those things through a robust transportation planning process. Um, and so, you know, the goals, a community's goals are set in their, in their comprehensive plans and their um, transportation master plans. Um, and and the process of setting those goals includes, needs to include um, participation of, of everybody in the community. Um, and so the you know the design resources and specific decisions on projects and you know specific design um, decisions that are made um, ideally need to be informed in some way by by the goals that the community is setting. Um, and if that, that process is robust and includes a lot of partners and stakeholders um, and full participation in the process, um, hopefully we get to a better outcome. Okay. So there are some examples of shared streets that also have higher traffic volumes. Does the guide not recommend shared streets on higher volume roads, even if speeds are low? And did, did your research uh, or did you research interaction of those with visual disabilities and transit on shared street? We didn't look at the second question specifically. Um, regarding volume, I, I think um, what we found is that speed and volume is really important for the function of the street as a shared street. Um, as I mentioned in uh, the intro, and as Dan mentioned, we defined uh, shared street, that term, pretty narrowly to, to be a place where, to, to be a, a street with a shared zone where pedestrians, bicyclists, and motor vehicle drivers mix in the same space. That's not likely to happen if there are high motor vehicle or relatively high motor vehicle volumes and speeds. Um, I think there's, you know, a range of volumes that um, I've seen in, in uh, kind of reported in various documents. I don't know that we've determined what the threshold is. Um, as far as speed, as I mentioned, um, we recommended in the guide 15 miles per hour or lower. I think you really need to think about the combination of those two factors and, and how they might influence the way a pedestrian, uh, pedestrian comfort um, when we went out and um, 
and experience some of the shared streets in, in the United States in connection with our workshops, we found that some of them were not functioning as intended, partly because of speeds and volume. So that's a very important consideration. Okay, so we have two more questions um, and then we'll try to wrap up this webinar. Um, the next question is, are there any recommendations for separation of pedestrian shared space zones during the winter when snow will obscure tactile warnings? I don't believe that that's an area that that we got into in detail. Um, if the, if there's a need for that, we'd we'd be certainly um, happy to have that conversation. Okay. And then our last question is: uh, Shared streets are similar to one earths seen in Europe, but our traffic laws are different. What effort is being made to change traffic laws to enhance the protection of vulnerable users? So I'll answer that, um, and it, and I don't I don't know that much about it to tell you the truth. I know that um, most local ju jurisdictions do not have um, a street classification for shared streets, um, so that's kind of an issue. Uh, Cambridge is one community that does have such a de designation and has some standards and guidelines related to to shared streets. Um, I think there is a legal question around shared streets and, and who is liable. You know, if you look at the shared street guide, we include marked crosswalks, um, marked mid-block crosswalks, and that's one of the reasons why, because um, legally in the United States, um, pedestrian uh, has the right of way only in a marked crosswalk. So that is an issue, and I, I think it's probably that something that needs closer attention. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but as you said, Jim, very much a, a state-specific um, situation. Great. So any final thoughts from our, our panelists before I wrap this up? Okay. Well, with that, um, this concludes our, our webinar. And thank you again, Dan, Janet, and Jim, for sharing your work. And thank you to everyone who could join us today. And remember to check out um, our other professional development offerings on our website at trek.pdx.edu. Have a great day, everyone. Thanks. Thank you so much. Thank you.